Hi everyone, thank you for checking out the first Raise the Game activity of the year. Um, I really appreciate everyone who's able to check in with this live stream and able to join us for this fantastic event that we've got in motion. Um, so just to give you some ideas, um, this is a brand new kind of activity that Raise the Game is doing called EDI Insights. Um, and we are exploring different research projects within the games industry space that explore elements around EDI. And it is with great pleasure that this first um, event that we do is working with the Gina Davis Institution of Gender and Media to present all about their double bladed sword research that they've taken and published last year and to give everyone who's not heard of it before some insights but also to allow those who have heard of it before some extra insights um, so i'm very happy to be partnering up with the organization for this activity um, it is as always a great pleasure to always do these online activities um, just for anyone brand new to raise the game we are a initiative all about um, long-term diversity and inclusion impact within the games industry. Specifically, we focus on the UK, but we never want to close our arms to the wider industry. And we're really happy, actually, to have some, some amazing international professionals join us for this activity, which I will allow Madeline to present later. Um, but we're, uh, we're absolutely grateful to have their presence and I'm looking forward to showing everything they've got to talk about. Um, so I just wanted to give this small introduction. I'll be putting some links into the channels for each of our live streams, um, just, just to highlight the report, to highlight Raise the Game and get you plugged into some of those spaces. But equally, um, I want to now bring to the stage the amazing Madeline, who will introduce herself, but equally tell you more about Gina Davis and also talk about some of the highlights with their research um, that I'm absolutely can't wait for you all to see. So to welcome Madeline to the stage. Thank you so much. I just want to thank Dom so much. I want to thank Yuki so much for this partnership. And I want to thank all of you for taking your time out of your very busy days uh, to join us. And in a nutshell, the Gina Davis Institute on Gender and Media was founded by two-time Academy Award winning Gina Davis. It was born out of her observations, seeing uh, a gender disparity in popular content, particularly in content that was being consumed uh, by children you know, and families. So fast forward, we've been looking at how people and particularly uh, marginalized groups are represented in popular content since 2004. And we were so privileged to be able to have the support of the Oak Foundation, which is based in Geneva, and one of our partners, Promundo, which looks at redefining uh, toxic masculinity around the world, to do our first ever video gaming study. And uh, that is what I'm going to share with you. And I'm going to get right into it. Uh, so we don't have uh, too many delays. And Dom, I'm going to let you jump in and make sure that uh, it does open and we can, we can see it. So I just want to do a check. Do you see it? Not yet, but let me... So not yet. If if you click, it should be the share button um, at the bottom of your screen, Madeline. Which I did do. So let me just try this again. Hang on, everybody. Uh, hold on. Ah, here we go. I found the problem. Now you're going to see it. Hold on. We're just waiting for it to open. Okay, do you see that now? 
No, don't know why it's not coming up. Uh, let me. Because it says StreamYard is sharing your screen. So I don't know if you need to give me access. And I'll explain to everyone while we're waiting what we did is, uh, so the questions that we wanted to answer with this study is what do boys and young men see and experience in online gaming in terms of you know relationships, representation, what does it mean you know to be a man? And so we did three things. One, uh, we looked at nearly 30,000 video game characters in about almost 700 segments of video games from the Twitch uh, streaming platform. We looked at the top games, the top streamers, and then what was being you know said. And then we did a survey about a, with about a thousand uh, men and boys ages, uh, 10 to, to 26. So Dom, are you able to uh, see the presentation? Yes, we can yes. all see the presentation now. Oh, fabulous. So we're going to get right into it. I'm not going to show you the whole study. I'm only going to show you some bits because we really want to get into our panel with our esteemed colleagues. So to no surprise for many of you uh, that female characters are you know, underrepresented, and particularly when you think about the population, uh, we're nowhere even near um, parity. And female characters are far more likely to be sexually objectified, 10 times more likely to be in sexually revealing clothing, and five times more likely to be partially nude. And these numbers are the highest if you compare them to television and film and some of our other verticals. When it comes to race ethnicity, because the Institute looks at six dimensions, when we look at how people are showing up and who is showing up, we look at the intersection of gender, race, ethnicity, LGBTQIA, age, body type, you know, abilities. But when it came to people of color, again, in the US, people of color are about 38%. And again, there's a big disparity there. Uh, there are no LGBTQIA characters. I think that's a big opportunity for the gaming industry, you know, to consider. And when we look at, um, you know, masculinity, and particularly when we look at the United States and the fight against racial injustice, we see here that almost half of the characters are carrying a gun during gameplay, and that white male characters are two times as likely to be carrying a weapon as male characters um, of color. A uh, one in three male characters are shown killing at least one human. And again, white male characters are four times as likely uh, as characters of color uh, to be killing people. Uh, uh, in terms of, you know, the streamer uh, comments, you know, we're not going to get into this today, but 100% of the top streamers are men. So that is, you know, clearly an opportunity. And even though we studied, uh, this study was conducted on the Twitch platform, this is absolutely, we love Twitch. They're aware of the study, and this is not a reflection on them, you know, or the platform. So the point that I wanted to walk you through is what did uh, the players, you know, say the people who are spending hours and hours uh, watching these players play. And like I said, we interviewed nearly a thousand men and boys ages uh, 10 all the way to 26. And they ranged from, you know, heavy players to light players. And light players was one to eight hours a week, medium between eight and 24 and heavy players literally around the clock. So what we found is on the positive side, and the reason why this study is called Double-Edged Sword is because gaming is a fantastic environment for men and boys to connect. One in three, so 31% of the boys say that they feel closer to their friends when they're playing video games. 35% of the boys say playing video games makes them feel less lonely. And one in four said the video games teach them how to be good friends. For, for men and boys and, and this notion of forming bonds and relationship, this is extremely important. And also, when it came to the older gamers, a vast majority report that video games help them connect with their guy friends. 
They can let their guard down to be closer. They can share their problems, their worries and concerns. Again, really, really important. And this is only done through gaming. So it's a very important and distinction. Now, we also found that two thirds of older gamers say that they're more likely to be their true selves. They can they can feel more comfortable than in real life. Now, in terms of violence and identity-based violence, one in four older gamers said they did experience racism, homophobia, um, and ableism on a regular basis. And one in five older gamers said they experienced sizeism, ageism, and sexism on a regular you know, basis. So again, these are just some other attributes of how the, the uh, consumers are feeling when they're in these rooms. And just very simply, uh, you know, we are here today because we're looking to get, you know, your help. You know, how can we have other characters that are more representative? How can we add more characters? How can we um, avoid the hypersexualization, you know, of female characters? Can there be more female characters? Um, how can we have more streamers from marginalized groups? How can we have male and female characters working together? How can we allow certain male characters to express a full range of emotion uh, and clearly taking more seriously moderation reporting? And how can we, you know, recognize all that you're doing? You know, clearly Yuki is doing that uh, because of uh, Raise the Game. And uh, we, you know, hope to see, you know, more of that. So with that, Dom, hopefully the uh, you no longer see the presentation and it's just back uh, to me on screen. Yep. Hey, okay. Excellent. And so now uh, we are so privileged to be joined by a group of esteemed colleagues. So Dom, I'm gonna let you bring everybody on and then in no particular checkerboard order, I'm going to introduce um, Anna Hart, who is a UI artist at Iron Galaxy. And I'm going to introduce Erica Fernandez, who's also a game designer at Iron Galaxy. And then we're thrilled to have Robin Mayamura, Vice President of Corporate and Interactive Talent Acquisition you know, at Skydance. So I just want to thank all of you uh, for joining us today. And you know, for some of uh, our, you know, the people that are watching, they may or may not uh, be looking at, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion, you know, as an initiative. And there's different ways to approach uh, inclusion, right? So um, I'm going to start um, with you, Robin. And can you talk about um, why has Skydance looked at diversity, equity, inclusion? Um, what is the pathway for you in terms of how you're thinking about it? Because there's many pathways. There's what are you doing in terms of talent and acquisition? What are you doing you know, with development? What are you doing with consumers? So there's a lot of different ways to approach it. How are you approaching this at Skydance? Well, I think one of the things is that it all kind of comes together because people want to work at a place where the content matches them. So at Skydance, we really are putting a focus on looking at our content across all of our divisions to make sure we are as inclusive as possible. Um, you know, one of the things, particularly in gaming, you already mentioned this is, you know, what do women look like? And, and there are little, even small things like, you could have a woman's face on the avatar, but then have, you know, the regular body. So we really wanted to make sure that we were looking at that. And then as the game progresses, how people are responding and reacting because it's different. Um, and we, we actually have somebody who is on staff who um, works across all of our divisions, um, who looks at our content and um, really about that inclusivity, whether it's body inclusivity, which is sorely lacking in games, or females and diversity, um, race diversity, color. Um, and so with that, then that, you know, then that helps me on the talent acquisition side, 
bring in other people because they see that we are putting a focus on it. Um, and um, it's, it's, it's challenging. It takes a long time, right? It takes, you have to really make the shift. You have to make from the leadership down, you have to, to really put a focus on it to make those changes. And then the changes, and then Erica can tell you, it's not like you say, oh, we want more women. And the next day they're there. You have to then create them <laughs> and put them in the game and test them. And so there is a long process of what does that look like and how do things fit into the game um, that we, you know, that we've really been working on. We just announced um, our, you know, second iteration that um, the sequel for Saints and Sinners. And so that's something that's a huge focus that we are working with coaches on. And, you know, people are taking classes just to make sure that we are looking at those things as we're going in. We, you know, had the Gina Davis Institute and Madeline come speak with our teams. Um, we also have a new media division um, that is, we announced is doing a project with Marvel. You know, so we're looking at it in many different ways and, and that will help inform you know, all the other ways that we can be more inclusive, both in-house and in the content. Thank you. And then I'm, I'm going to come back to you um, with an impact question, but I'm going to turn to um, Anna uh, and Erica. So as Robin said, just can't do this, snap a finger overnight. So the same question for you is what does diversity, equity, and inclusion look like at Iron Galaxy, how are you approaching it from a talent standpoint, from a character standpoint, from a design standpoint? Um, can you tell us a little bit about what's happening um, at Iron Galaxy? Yeah, I'll take the, the wheel for this one. Um, so Iron Galaxy looks both internally and externally because not only do we have to look within ourselves, but also within the community because that really also helps bring more diverse hires, it may help just make this message more accessible. So we also have, so internally we have a DNI committee that is actually the employees that try to give input and the company is always listening to see what we think would help. And so we're constantly adapting and changing to make these processes more streamlined, easier to go into. We also have scholarships for diversity set up to help new people coming into the industry to make it more accessible. So we have a ton of stuff going on for that. And then also within games, we have we're trying to uh, we're trying to add more body, add more body types, skin tones, genders, and just kind of give uh, players and their the individuality that everybody loves to have. Yeah, Anna, you want to? Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. Yeah, I'll jump in. Um, yeah, and uh, I'll add to that too. That um, it starts at the top. Uh, uh, starting with Dave Lang, I think he started Iron Galaxy with really clear vision uh, for himself of what he wanted to create for a company. And um, having diverse hiring is just uh, core to that. Um, so it's never a question of, oh, maybe this is something we should start doing. Um, just unfortunately started as a smaller company of like 13 or so people. Uh, but as we've grown um, with, uh, uh, as we've grown, um, there's been uh, much more voices, like Erica was mentioning, of different programs we can do uh, along with the scholarships uh, uh, for the community outreach. Like we've reached out to uh, high school students in Chicago, uh, you know, to try to reach out um, different class levels too. Uh, you know, not everyone can afford the grad school or, uh, you know, the different high levels of education. So that's like another area of research, I think, or, or of uh, outreach um, that is important uh, to getting a more diverse candidate uh, base. Um, but yeah, and, and like Erica has mentioned, um, that uh, having a more diverse uh, employee pool, I think, has helped so much with our, our new uh, IP, Rumbleverse. I'm so excited about it. Um, one of our pillars from the start is having characters available that there's some there's something for everyone, uh, and that's that's been so helpful to think from the start. Uh, and as for me, with the uh, UI, um, with the uh, yeah user interface, in case uh, UI is not the most known uh, term, um, it's so important to think about diversity and accessibility for a wide range of audiences. Um, 
So there's uh, more than what you uh, anticipate uh, playing your game, and you should welcome them all instead of uh, putting up a, a blocker. So I have a follow-up question for you, um, Erica and Anna. Uh, this scholarship program, can you tell us how does it work? And there may be other partners that want to institute that in their company, or there may be people who want to apply. Can you walk us, can you kind of unpack what does scholarships mean? How does it work? What has happened? Uh, and just all the details on that. Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have a, a, a it's, um, since I'm, I'm a designer, I don't have the exact knowledge and how that works. I do know that we work through two diversity scholarships, one's with DePaul University, and the other one is with the University of Florida. We also have sponsorships with like the Latinx Career Fair and Game Devs of Color. Um, and we also try to be inclusive cultures. We post jobs that target LGBTQ plus communities as well. So I don't have specifics, but I just I just know that they exist and that we do try to find new ways to, do, to reach out. Yeah, and uh, something new too, uh, in case Erica doesn't mention it because uh, she's in the lead right now, but we started a, a referral program. Uh, and Erica's in the lead with, I think, referring some 30 people uh, yeah. to apply. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's just great. Um, yeah, because uh, uh, something that I found interesting that really spoke to me too uh, was uh, how if women see a job uh, application uh, go up, uh, if they don't feel they meet those minimum requirements, they won't even try to go in for the interview. So if we do referral programs like this, just you know, try to coach each other and just say, hey, you know, just go in for the interview. Uh, what can you lose? Uh, it's, I think that's like super helpful. It's a great idea. And and do you have any um, feedback on what's happened to the people or where do you put them? Because there's so many different places that you can put the scholarship recipients. Do you put them in UI design or you see where there could be a fit? Are they shadowing you? Like, what do you do with them? I think that's one of the really awesome things about gaming is that there's tons of different types of departments and jobs within gaming that you can really get your foot in the door. Um, it's difficult to figure out exactly what you like to do and want to do. It's something that it takes a, a little bit of refining once you once you get when you start school. You like I want to be a game designer. I didn't know I was going to be a UI designer until I was a couple years into it. And then I realized, wow, I really love this. This is what I want to do. Um, but their gaming has not has artists, uh, designers, engineers. We have IT. We also have recruiters. We have um, all different types of positions. So just because you, if you love gaming, but you don't think you're particularly creative, there are other avenues to get into the industry um, that isn't just in development as well. Yeah, that's a great Thank point. Thank you for that. Uh, so Robin, oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, go oh, ahead. Oh, sure. Yeah, I just wanted to quick jump in. Uh, that really spoke to me, Erica, because I, I also thought I would start out as like a, a concept artist or a character artist, uh, even applied for QA at one point. Um, but then at one point saw, oh, UI, uh, that that's what I want to do. Uh, yeah, so it, you can start somewhere and totally uh, land somewhere else in a few years. Yeah, I will. I, let me jump on that. Also, one of the things that our teams across, you know, both actually gaming and animation, which have some crossover, was that there are so many games, and and one of the the kind of obstacles is, you know, if you see don't see anyone like you in the game, it kind of puts you out. But you know, it's, you don't think, oh, I can see myself doing that. And then a lot of people, like you said, Anna, are thinking more on storyboard art. You know. Are you a designer? And there are so many other jobs that are there. You know, we started working with an organization um, called Better Youth that caters to mainly foster, former foster and homeless youth, um, just to work with them on training. And we do this, it's a 30 week program. Um, but part of that is people in our organization speaking to these students talking about their path because there are some there's project management if you're not an artist you know there are so many other there's sales there's marketing there's so many other avenues to get into gaming um 
And there's so many different ways that you can get to a different place. And so we wanted them to see that because if you're not a designer, there's still a way to do something that you love in an industry that you love. And um, I think that's really important. And, and that's where also true inclusion comes in because if you are reaching out to more people and they see that there's a path for them, you'll get more very different perspectives and very different people coming in. So Robin, I wanted to, you started with saying, look, this is a long process. It doesn't happen overnight. Um, and you've been um, very um, progressive in the announcements that you've made. Can you unpack a little for us, you know, what is the process? So for example, Anna and Erica mentioned, you mentioned you have the partnership with the youth group. Are you also recruiting at the high school level, at the college level? Does it matter what level? And also, can you talk about any impact um, as you've started um, this work that you've seen? Any changes or any examples, whether it's from a talent side, whether it's from how you are now approaching, you know, the marvel of it um, or saints and sinners? Like, what has been the expectation that has been presented to the you know, internally to the to the design team and for the people who are working with right. you? Yeah, I think one of the things is we do, you know, we rely on our internal expert on inclusion in the content um, to make those changes in the characters. And in some of, you know, I think one of the things that was interesting in the Gina Davis research in gaming was the, you know, for the male players, you know, white male players and attacking versus other people who are more protective, you know, looking at how people play the game, which takes a long time, right? There's a lot of research that goes involved, gets, um, goes into it. Um, but we are attacking it from every avenue that we can. Um, we have a woman um, on our marketing team who is, um, heavily involved in uh, Women in Gaming International. And so they are really looking, you know, she brings in a lot of other perspectives for women. Um, and we, you know, on my side, then I'm also um, recruiting and trying to bring in more diversity because it's the people in the room who are making decisions who can say, oh, you know, that doesn't look right. Or maybe you could do that, that you don't think about unless you know. You just, there's no way you could be as inclusive as you want, but you only know what you know. Um, and so that's something that we're, we're, we're working on all those things concurrently. Um, and, you know, it's kind of a self-fulfilling thing. It's, I need to get more diverse people into the studio. You can do that by having more diversity within the game but you need the people to have the different perspectives to get the diversity in the game. So it's, you know, it, it, it's kind of attacking from all fronts. And we do bring in those people to kind of have those checks and balances, like having you come in and speak with us, you know, look, you know, having somebody from women in gaming come in and speak with us and kind of giving us that other perspective to, to make, you know, people think about it. And also it gives um, those voices that maybe would be hesitant to say something out loud, kind of a forum to do that and the license to feel brave enough to say, make, you know, make those statements and, and bring those perspectives in. But it's, yeah, it's Thank a lot. Of <laughs> uh, so Dom, I think we're starting to get some questions. Do you want to Share those questions um, for our esteemed panelists. Absolutely. And just to say, everything you guys have been saying is amazing and making the chat buzzing. Um, so to kick off, this is a question directly for Anna and Erica. Um, one of the audience members asked, I'm curious about that referral system, especially linked with coaching support. Could you explain more about how that works? Okay. I'll you again if you want to. Oh, sure. I, I, you do it. You can go. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, I, I could speak to how uh, at our Galaxy we have uh, basically what I would call a mentorship problem, or not problem, program, sorry, uh, mentorship pro uh, program. 
Um, so every week you have a check-in. Uh, we write how your week's going. Uh, you have a call um, with a lead uh, just to discuss, like, is there any challenges both uh, with work or outside of work? Uh, so there's always someone there to speak to. Um, and uh, everyone wants to see you succeed and grow uh, so that um, each year uh, you can look back and see, um, you know, all, all, the, all that you've accomplished. Uh, yeah, so there, there's that great support. Um, within the team. So you're not just like left on an island on your own uh, during uh, COVID times. So uh, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll take it to you, Erica, because I know you also do some uh, mentorship on your own. I do. Uh, so the referral system primarily is just to help us get different applications and applicants and have more diverse. Uh, so I reach out to people that I know that are in the industry and I'm like, hey, we have these positions open why don't you apply? But in terms of mentorships for people that aren't within the company, um, Iron Galaxy actually partnered with International Game Developer Association, IGDA, um, to offer mentorships. So basically, I signed up to mentor a college student within uh, who's still in school. I don't know exactly the range in terms of how far in education, but they can sign up. And then I sync up with my mentee. I try to do it at least twice a month, a couple of times a month, and that's all within our company time. They want us to do it with, as part of our work because they want to see more active with the different communities. So I actually have a mentee that I've been giving feedback, whether it's on final projects, how's your resume looking, how is like, do you, do you have an interview coming up? Do you want help with like figuring out questions that might come up? Um, everybody handles it differently, but they, we do try to do programs to help mentor as well. Amazing. That's fantastic. I hope um, audience member who asked that, that answers your question. And I think actually you tipped on to the second question, which was all um, about does the support continue when you're in the role for these programs that bring in new talent? And I guess this can equally be um, pointed to you as well, Robin, um, for any programs that you drive to bring new talent in, does the support that they get around inclusion and diversity continue when they're in, let's say that they, they get the job and they're in house with you, your team. Um, so for us, I mean, it is an, it's an early program. We are, um, you know, we, we actually do it across the entire studio between the divisions as well, where we bring people together um, and, you know, do those kinds of, roundtables, um, you know, we can find mentors, but it, we're definitely in the early stages of like a formal program like that. Mm -hmm. um, within um, our interactive division specifically, you know, like we have a, a team group for women that work there, you know, just to support. Um, but yeah, so we're, it, it's something that we've been working on and it, you know, have come together a few times, but not something super formal yet. No, but it's really good to know that you're starting that journey um, because, yeah. again, it gives hope and that gives potential and amazing things to come. And then the next question that we received, which can be for anyone who'd like to take it, is um, it was mentioned that the attempts to include more diversity in terms of employees and characters, does this include people with different abilities? Um, so that may include um, disability, neurodiversity, much more of these invisible lens diversities that um, on first viewing may not be obvious, but obviously by thinking about them within your teams, you can venture out. So I guess the core of the question is, what kind of activities are you doing to kind of think about these invisible lens diversities? Um, I can answer this a little bit. So I'm a, I'm, a user, I'm a UI designer, user interface, but it also has to do a lot with user experience, so UX design as well. So we often have to take into consideration people with colorblindness, accessibility in terms of controller, using sound to help with design, to make games more accessible to a wider range of people is definitely something that we are always striving to do. Um, we're always learning new and better ways to do it as well. And also within the company, I think, I believe that we're always trying to accommodate with whoever needs to an employee might have as well. Excellent. Yeah, just to uh, add on that, um, when uh, IG worked on KI and uh, when there were tournaments uh, for Killer Instinct, it was such a great opportunity to see 
the audience that were passionate about that game. Um, so I, uh, there's a player named Wheels. Uh, I love that guy, fellow uh, Green Bay Packers fan. Um, uh, he uh, has a disability, and I think about him all the time of like, can he pick up and play this game? I want to make sure that he can because he's awesome. Uh, and there's also a, a blind uh, player who did a, 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 um, a speech for us about how much sound design can help uh, accessibility in gaming. Um, but yeah, so I think uh, uh, being a studio that can uh, interact with your community uh, really um, reminds you of that uh, audience members that might not have been in your original thought of what the target would be, but it's it's much broader and you should welcome them as best you can. Fantastic. And what about Sky Dance, Robin? What have you guys been um, looking into around such things as social mobility, neurodiversity, and accessibility? Yeah, as far as in the game, I can't speak to that because I don't I don't know as much as you know Eric and Anna are really in that game. Um, but we are looking, you know, as an organization, um, really looking at different aspects of um, ableism and how that looks, you know, because the more you normalize it, the more it's going to be, you know, just a part of whatever content you're creating. Um, so we've had, you know, roundtables around it. And, um, you know, we do, we are, we try to be as, as inclusive of an environment as possible, but also being educational. We have somebody who is, um, she actually is in the Forbes 30 under 30 um, uh, in entertainment. Um, she is a quadriplegic. She is on our legal team and, you know, was it is an advocate and was a child actress advocate. And so, um, you know, she can speak to a lot of people in our organization about what that looks like. And I think that's been really valuable is having people that, you know, with it just within your realm that it's you're not thinking about it it's just part of our culture and our nature absolutely and i absolutely love that aspect of role models it's it's something that i generally love to encourage within studios because it's not about kind of oh here's this insert diversity it's looking at your talent within and actually going these are some amazing people how do we actually show them authentically and make them role models to this next generation yeah. so it's fantastic to hear um that within both your teams especially um congratulations to your colleague in the for Th forbes lady under 30. hopefully i pronounced that correctly yeah. um, <laughs> in okay so the next question we've received is um kind of and it might i don't know whether you'd be able to answer this um anyone yeah. but We've had a question where we've been asked about what are the considerations around diversity when approaching content creators and thinking about voiceover talent um, for your products and games. I uh, don't know if, whether that's something that anyone would like to try and answer. Yeah, I could only speak to that our community management team is really excited to amplify uh, like under uh, underviewed voices or uh, uh, new content creators uh, coming to Twitch. Um, yeah, I, I think, uh, uh, yeah, we're really excited to see uh, how the next uh, few years go. So. Excellent. And it's absolutely like, again, the games that you guys have each talked about that your studios are working on, they work with some great IPs or brand new IPs. So the potential there is endless. Um, so another question that we've received um, is for people trying to enter the industry, what about those who did not go to college, trying to be inclusive and think about that kind of education leg of inclusion? Um, and I guess you've already mentioned this through your scholarships, but I guess um, one way to perceive this is, is there any activity that's thinking about the grassroots approach of bringing this talent in or inspiring this talent who may not consider going to college um, for whatever reason. 
Um, I can kind of answer this. I've had an, an interesting um, career progression in that I, I did go to college. I have a bachelor's in game production. However, I didn't go in for my master's, but there's a lot of my colleagues who do have master's degrees. Um, the biggest thing was that I started, I got my foot in the door and I started learning as much as I could and getting that experience. And I think the nice thing about the gaming industry is that even if you don't necessarily have that knowledge, that um, education. If you have the experience and the knowledge, so there's tons of free tools and game uh, game engine tools that you can use that you can start working on your own personal projects. So even if you don't necessarily have the education, but you can show I made this, I, I can do this, you get considered. We, education isn't always necessarily needed. And I know a lot of my coworkers don't necessarily have traditional education backgrounds either. And like I said earlier, there's so many different ways of getting into the industry that don't all require education as well. Yeah, I definitely agree. We, um, I feel, I mean, I don't, most of your audience, I assume is in the UK. I don't know if it's the same issue, but it's a huge national conversation here about the cost of college. Um, and student debt. And, you know, and that is also one of the things why we partnered with Better Youth is that we knew there is there is definitely a path into gaming that does not require college. And so that for most of our roles is not a requirement at, at all um, because th it just, it doesn't necessarily make sense. Um, and right now I feel like the U.S. in general is moving towards that anyway, just because college is costing out, I mean, the majority of the population. You know, I'm in California and they say like 28 percent of California State uh, University students are homeless um, because the cost is too high. So they're couch surfing or they're living in their cars or, you know, whatever. Um, and that's that can't be the only path into getting a job. Absolutely. And that's really great to hear that expansion of that work and what more can be done. And um, just to pick up on your point, Robin, that's definitely a big conversation that's starting here in the UK as well. How can we bring greater accessibility to students of all ages rather than, oh, you have to go down the set path, rather thinking, how can we embrace those who may have some really hands-on talent who want to start as soon as leaving high school, but also accommodate those who might want to go to uni. So it's a very interesting topic and it's really great to hear some of your insights around that. Um, the questions aren't just to you guys though. Madeline, I've got a question for you. Is there a white paper or conference paper regarding the original research that more fully details um, the coding and survey methodology? Oh, I think you're on mute. Hopefully. Oh. Hopefully we just get the mic sorted. Um, well, I guess uh, while, while we wait, I'll jump in oh. and say quick uh, um, to the last question. Uh, my husband and I worked on a uh, dive kick independently for a uh, Chicago tournament and that opened the door to talking to Dave Lang uh, in Iron Galaxy. So just like a, a personal anecdote uh, speaking to that of uh, I also went to college, but my college did not uh, teach anything game uh, game related. So Excellent. So um, to kind of turn that into a knowledge knowledge nugget nugget is do events and work on potential projects that could lead to greater network opportunities. Excellent. And Madeline, can we hear you? Can you hear me now? Yay. Woo. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, so we, Dom, I had provided the link to you. Uh, so if you could share that with our audience, yep. they can look at the full, uh, full study and uh, also uh, if anyone has any other questions, you know, give us your email and we'd be happy to follow up with you with any questions on the study. And also if you want to get, you know, involved. Absolutely. We shared it earlier, but um, for everyone watching, we're going to share the link again. Because um, again, it'd be great to 
get more people to see it, but also to get involved in the future work around it because it's not static, it's ever moving forward. Like the next question, which will be, how do you get the balance of making games more inclusive and accessible while continuing to appeal to the player? And I guess this can be more to a question to Iron Galaxy, but Robin, if you've got any insights to this as well, please do feel free to answer in. Um, one of the tools that games game companies often use is user testing. So it's bringing people in and having them play the game and getting and taking that feedback. It's why you see those beta tests going on for lots of games and alpha testings. We do that to get feedback to see areas where players are struggling, where something doesn't make sense so that we can then improve upon it. It's something that you're always making changes to. You're always taking into account and constantly. There's never... I designed this, this is how it's gonna be done. Never works out that way. You redesign things constantly and you're constantly changing it as different needs come up. So it's just a revolving door of adapting, getting better, refining. It's not, so there's no, um, there's no really one size, there's no one size fits all at all in that type of development. So, it's difficult to give ex an exact answer on how to do that, but we do try. Absolutely. It's a, it's a, almost a developing science in itself. And then, Robin, would you like to add into anything with that thought about how um, Sky Dance are considering not only um, quality of gameplay, but how they bring that into the inclusion kind of ideas and perspectives i agree i think it's all in the testing and making sure things you know work work well for everyone and with that you would have to bring in different people to test you know that's why you test with a variety of audiences also amazing and then i mean we're, we're getting filled with questions <laughs> so i mean like i said i said to the panelists before people you will be blowing their minds. So I'm really glad that we've got so many questions coming in. The next one we have is, how do you balance intentionality versus opportunity? So the example that the question giver has given is the philosophy of, we don't care what your gender, race, sex is, we love everyone, versus we want to add this certain demographic into our company. So I guess that's a question of how do your companies juggle that data-driven perspective on recruitment versus the inclusive culture aspect and really balance to make sure one doesn't take over the other? Um, you know, there has to be intentionality because that's where unconscious bias comes in. If you have a singular group, um, you know, who maybe all have the same culture fit and all, you know, get along really well, you end up with more of a homogeneous team. So you do have to have the intentionality. You can't just hire people that worked really well with you at the last place. You can't, you know, you have to have that diversity of perspective and voice. And that doesn't mean, you know, you have to be at odds all the time, but it means that you aren't necessarily going to think the same ways. And to start, there has to be an in intentionality of bringing in other groups specifically. And, um, and then at a certain point, when you have that full, you know, spectrum of different thoughts and opinions is when you do it is just inclusive and then you're not thinking about it as much and it just is something that is ingrained in the team i've seen it in a lot of places um and 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 but it, it does start with you know maybe you can't hire that person who you said is the best it's the best of the people you know that doesn't mean they're the best and that doesn't mean they're the best for this particular game or particular team and so it, it's it's changing your mindset around what that means. Um, but it, it does take, it, you've got to start somewhere in order to do that. 100%. What about from Iron Galaxy side, um, Anna or Erica? 
Uh, sure, I'll jump in quick. Um, I, I can't speak to what um, like uh, the hiring process above me is, but um, I, I think it's it's been a great help to be uh, involved with the interviews. Uh, it's it's helpful to have a more diver diverse group uh, involved with that uh, process. Um, just uh, you know, going through the different candidates and um, you know, seeing uh, representation of reality, right? Like we're uh, we're a diverse uh, society, so uh, it only makes sense to have that uh, reflect in the the company uh, uh, less people. Yeah, absolutely, and I think that's an excellent point. Is like because normally you're so used to just the recruitment people handling that, but actually by bringing the greater team into that process, you're not only bringing that diversity of thought, but actually you are coming out of your own biases because the recruiter might be like, "Oh, this person looks perfect on paper," but actually when you interview them and have your perspectives add in, you might come up with a completely different image of what that role will look like, and then suddenly. You've got someone from a background that you never expected, but equally comes into the team amazingly. Yeah, and I think one thing that you need to think about, and and we, I feel like it's been hit on several times, is everybody has a different path. So, you know, if you, you know, Erica, I think you said you went to school for game production and, you know, had a different path to UI design. You have to take that chance on that person that they can do this other thing um, instead of just going to your go-tos and, and those paths. And they tend to really be with people who are diverse. We see that a lot more where they kind of wind around in different ways. Um, and that gives you also a more holistic perspective on, you know, game design and game and game production. Um, but you have to you have to know that that happens and be able to take those chances and they work out so many more times than not yeah i love robin's point um also it's just to kind of give more background into like my career progression i actually joined iron galaxy as a qa analyst so i wasn't always a designer but i showed interest and I started working things on my own free time and, I, and the company was aware that I was interested. So they took a chance to see like if I could handle it, if I could do it. And when they saw I could, they were like, we're gonna invest in you. We're gonna do this and you're gonna we'll see how you go. And two years later, here I am. <laughs> so I think it's another thing that companies really also have to look at is giving people opportunities to prove, their, prove that they can do the job, um, which really is just, I, Iron Galaxy is very good at also looking at, and Iron Galaxy is very good at looking at internally, how can we make changes to help um, keep this balance within the culture, within the studio already existing and how to make it better as we bring in new people. Yeah, I love that. Really investing in people and seeing their progression within, because your internal equity is the best place to find value, right? They, they have been loyal, they know different aspects of the game, so even though there's training for to go from QA into design, you also have that other knowledge of the game and the team that is invaluable. Um, and that's something that we do a lot too. We definitely believe in that career development. Fantastic. I absolutely love that point. I'm just noticing the time. Um, I don't think we're gonna be able to answer all remaining questions. Um, but we will try to get one or two more through the finishing line. Um, and I'll try and merge one or two questions. So um, one question to you all is, how do you think the increase in remote working slash flexible working is developing and changing the industry as in for opportunities, but also challenges for bringing in um, candidates from different backgrounds? Sorry, can you just repeat that? I missed no, no part that kind of cut out. So um, how do you think the increase in remote working and flexible working is creating opportunities, but also challenges for bringing in diverse candidates slash new team members? Um, I think that there, I mean, as far as diversity, like there's many different aspects of that question, um, but 
Um, you know, I think there are challenges of just the culture, you know, keeping people together and working together when everybody, nobody's together. Um, so, you know, you have to over, overcome that. And people, if you were looking at bringing in different people who you don't know, who've never worked with, who have different perspectives, it's harder to mesh that into a ho cohesive team, right? Because if you're on Slack, that is how you communicate is very different than face-to-face. -face. Um, and so it really is just taking more time. And then you also have to look at where people are. And it's a it's a random thing, but, you know, uh, Dom, Madeline and I were talking about it, is the time differences also matter, you know, because you can't, if you are hiring everywhere, yes, you can have different people and it opens up your pool a lot and you can have much more diversity of thought from very different countries and different places. But how do you work together as a team when you're on, you know, very different schedules? So there, you know, I think that the world has a lot to look into about this. And, and I think it's, it's going to be a long-term kind of things are going to shift a lot because as, as these are coming together, not all teams are coming together. Well, I've, you know, sat in a lot of different conversations. Um, and so the team building aspect is definitely more challenging. Um, and we have to figure out a way to do that because I do think that the world will, especially in gaming, be a much more remote world moving forward. Um, I don't think that this is a temporary thing. Absolutely. Yeah, that 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 um, commenting of culture and how we how we trying to communicate to one another, Iron Galaxies, and trying and trying various new ways to help us connect with our fellow employees because we've hired so many people over the pandemic. Um, I think like over a hundred people within the past year. So we're continuously growing. So the studio has been trying to figure out ways to help us talk to each other and really communicate. So we've done things like we've had, we have lunches, we have parent and caregiver discussions. We do um, virtual happy hours. We did cooking shows <laughs> where a bunch of us would just cook and watch everybody cook, um, which actually ended up turning into a bunch of us everybody putting in um, recipes and we all, we have a cookbook um, during the holidays, we try to have events. So there's a lot of ways to try to help. The studio can help make this an easier uh, chat. I want to say challenge for with the pandemic, um, but those, those types of act activities, I believe we actually recently just did um, a, escape room a virtual escape room which was hilarious for a bunch of gamers <laughs> to do a virtual escape room um so yeah there's just there's a lot to do that you can try to help make this an easier thing to do work from home has definitely changed how the company approaches but even before the pandemic we had lunches we had um beach days we tried to do all different kinds of things and absolutely I'm technically remote because most of my team is in Chicago, uh, but I still personally really miss being in an, in the office uh, and that social aspect, that direct face-to-face uh, -face communication. Um, uh, yeah, so it's complicated, uh, but there's, um, yeah, there's different routes that make it better. Uh, and in different ways, it, it's it's good in some ways, but yeah, it's, it's, it's tricky. Absolutely, but I think with your advice is, it definitely helps. And again, just noticing the time. So we do have some questions, but what I think I'd, we'd do is we might do a behind the scenes. When we do an article and we release the recording, we might see if our lovely panellists are able to answer these off the clock, just so, because um, there's some really interesting questions. But I think a really nice question that brings really big spotlight to each of our panelists that I want to end this off with is um, one of our audience members asks, what's been your personal proudest contribution to either a game or your studio um, that you've worked on? And I think this would be a really nice one because each of you get to highlight one of your proudest moments. Um, and I'll, <laughs> yeah, I'll, um, I'll kick off with... Erica, then we go to Robin, and then we go to Anna. And then, Madeline, if you want to kick off about 
talking about the proudest moment of developing the research, I think that'd be a nice one as well to end off with, because obviously we don't want to forget that this event was to spotlight the research as well. Yeah, so for my proudest my career moment, obviously getting to become a designer sure. is a huge goal. But um, I'm sorry, did I, did I interrupt wrong? <laughs> but uh, my biggest accomplishment I'm super proud of is Rumbleverse. So please check it out on our website. You can um, check out the trailers and all of that. Super excited and so jazzed. There's so much hype going on for that game. I will put that in the chat for everyone. Um, it's definitely worth checking out. Robin, what about your... Um, yes. Yeah. So for me, I think one of the things that Skydance really has invested in during this time is um, for our employees. And I run, I run talent acquisition, but I also run our DEI initiatives as well as our um, talent engagement. Um, you know, Eric, we're talking about all the different events and things we've been putting out content and doing things just to keep people as engaged together as possible. Um, and, you know, we started a really strong wellness program. Um, I brought in Headspace for everyone just because I think this has been a challenging time. And so being able to help people through this has been definitely my, my biggest, um, achievement for sure. Cause it's been, it's been a challenge for people. You know, we, we did things and we are fortunate. We have an animation studio run by John Lassner. We had the director of Shrek who did a class to drawing Shrek and um, Donkey for people, you know, employees, which was amazing, and their kids. So we've done a lot of things for families and um, and and really kind of reaching out to the community, which has been really nice. Uh, as for myself, uh, I'm super excited for uh, Rumbleverse as well, but my um, personal uh, favorite mo moment has been uh, going to a Killer Instinct tournament, um, sitting in the audience, uh, watching a match, uh, just hanging out by myself. Uh, and these two guys next to me asking me, like, hey, uh, so what are you doing here? And I was able to say for the first time, oh, I I'm a developer. Uh, I, I helped I helped to make that. Um, so it's just a really cool uh, moment. Uh, it it's a good reminder. Give yourself a pat on the back sometimes. Excellent. And Madeline, what's been the proudest moment for you so far? Well, first of all, that our theory of change works, that the industry is embracing the opportunity to infuse more diversity, equity, inclusion. They care about, you know, what children are seeing, what children are, you know, playing with. And we achieved actually three mission goals one uh, was achieving gender parity for female lead characters in the top rated children's television programming. That was in 2019. In 2020, we achieved gender parity for female lead characters in the 100 largest grossing films uh, theatrically out of the U.S. And then this past fall, we showed that for the first time, uh, women and girls as secondary minor characters we achieved gender parity uh, for the first time in, in television history. So we hope that will expand to people of color and LGBTQIA, and we're hoping to bring that theory of change to the gaming industry. So that's why having this partnership uh, with Yuki and also having uh, the uh, warm reception, you know, from Iron Galaxy and, and from Skydance, you know, it takes all of us together, but we're really looking forward to being able to report, you know, progress, hopefully, if we do this again, you know, in a year. And uh, we're just so grateful uh, to have this partnership and also grateful for everyone who's watching today uh, that they can also uh, join with Raise the Game and, and help push the needle along. 100% here, here, here. But I've absolutely loved hearing each of your proudest moments. And um, again, everyone, thank you for joining us today. Any questions that weren't able to be answered but might be able to be answered behind the scenes when there's no timer, we'll definitely ask our panelists for a bit more of their time and try and get an article together with the recording of this. Um, to do some meta so when you're watching the recording i'll be like saying that you'll be like oh there's the questions just for some meta first perspective on that 
But nevertheless, I want to give a big virtual. Um, they want, I wish I had the stream deck because then I could play clapping. But I really hope in the comment section you can, or clapping. <laughs> I want to give a big round of applause to all of our amazing panelists, Anna, Erica, and Robin. I want to give a massive big up to Madeline. I also want to give a big up to Pearl, who was meant to be on the panel, but unfortunately fell ill. But luckily, she is an amazing person. We're definitely going to do some follow-up. Um, but I, did, I didn't want to leave without doing a shout-out to her, because, again, in the lead-up to this, she has done some amazing conversations with us. So I just wanted to make sure she gets some recognition. Um, and again, thank you to everyone who joined us today. We're definitely going to be doing more activities. Um, as shown in the chat, please check out the full report. Please check out Rumbleverse and Skydance for all their projects. Um, and I hope everyone has a nice, lovely rest of whatever time you're at. Maybe day, maybe night. But as long as there's a smile on your face and positivity in your heart, that's all that matters. So have a great one, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.